last person standing between uh, before the end of the day, so I'll make this brief. <laughs> Try not to bore you. Um, so uh, my name is Ray Paik. I'm a community manager at GitLab, and I joined GitLab about 14 months ago. Uh, and prior to that, I was I was at the Linux Foundation, working mostly on uh, with a variety of networking uh, communities. Uh, and I think I started looking at uh, open source metrics for over the past like five years or so. Uh, so it was honored to be involved in the founding of Chaos like two years ago. Time just flies. Like who would have thought, right? So uh, it was in was it L.A.? I can't remember. Yeah. So um, so the title is. I mean, sorry, it's, if it sounds a little pithy. Like, what are all these metrics telling me? Uh, the point I'm I'm trying to make, and Danny made a lot of the good points with a lot better graphics and pictures. So thank you for that. Um, uh, and I think the subtitle of this talk could be, you know, what am I supposed to do with all these data? Because uh, I think we're at a point where, I mean, even just over the last few years, there's, I don't think there's a shortage of numbers, data, or metrics, or however you want to, like, look at, like, community data. Uh, I think it's, it's just more challenging to figure out, like, what's, what are the set of metrics that I need to use for my community? And even if it's the same community, the, the, your focus area is going to change over time as your community matures. And I put these two uh, screenshots there. Uh, one on the left is evolution. We have the evolution work group. I think it, this used to be called growth, maturity, and decline when we started. So that was, I, I had to like jog my memory back to figure out what it used to be called. And risk is like more recent. And, I think the risk team started meeting, like, it's definitely less than a year. Like, has it like, been like six months or so? Uh, but e so for growth maturity and decline or evolution, these are a set of metrics that it's been around for a long time. I mean, even before chaos, like things like code reviews, uh, you know, issue tracking. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of like metrics that are available, even like reference implementations that you need to look at. Uh, you can look at. I mean, that's the whole reason why chaos exists, and even risk, which is relatively new. Um, there are. I mean, I was like pleasantly surprised to see a number of different areas that you can look at. Things like you know licensing compliance, test coverage. Um, is your project dependent on just few people or few member organizations? I mean, these are all like good things to look at. Uh, so the point is, there's. I don't think. Like, I mean, it's very rare at this day and age to say, I don't know how to quite measure this. It's trying to figure out like what to measure and how to use those numbers for your, for your community. Um, so like I said, when I started at GitLab about uh, 14 months ago, or even before I started, I mean, during the interview process, it was pretty obvious that there weren't like a reliable, a good set of metrics to look at, to look at the GitLab community. Uh, I mean, GitLab, as you know, is it, we're, we're an open source company. That's how we started from, from day one. I think the first commit by our CTO, uh, uh, Dimitri, was made, like, I forget which month in 2011. You can still see the first commit. Uh, we've been, uh, I mean, open source from day one, but it was really hard to distinguish how much of the contribution was coming from within GitLab and from and then from from the wider community uh, and I mean I was explaining to Yana earlier like the only set of metrics that we publish uh, bef uh, you know even when I first joined was basically a ranking of all the commits or, or merge requests that got merged by like just list of names it doesn't even tell you whether there are or were part of GitLab at some point or they're just coming from the wider community so it was little difficult to get a sense as to how who and how much contribution was coming from outside of GitLab. Uh, and so you'll see on the on upper left, uh, what this shows is that we have a month, uh, GitLab, we have a monthly release cycle. Every 22nd of each month, we have a new release uh, that comes out. It's a pretty fast cycle that we go through. Uh, one of the things I look at was, so this is only looking at contributions from the wider community, people that are not employed by GitLab. Uh, I think I joined the company around like 11.2, 11.3 timeframe. Uh, I mean, around that time, we're hovering around 130 merge requests that came from outside of the company. So when I looked at that data, I couldn't figure out, like, is that good or bad? I mean, is that 130? I mean, of course you want more, right? As, as a community manager, you want more contributions coming from the community, but 
I couldn't figure out like what to make sense of that number. Like it's it's hovered around 130, and we're slightly climbing up, which is which is great. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to look at was like if you look at media at open days uh, column on the chart at the bottom, uh, we it's like the based on like a. Uh, depending on the release, the number hasn't fluctuated a whole lot. The median open days is less than five days, which I thought was pretty decent. Because uh, I've, I've seen communities where things don't get even looked at for like a year, right? I mean, be, uh, we're not perfect, but it, you know, if you look at the median numbers, it's, it definitely gets at least reviewed and acknowledged within a, f within a few days, which is what we want to maintain. I mean, there are, I mean, I was looking at one merge request on the plane yesterday on the way down uh, on the airline Wi-Fi. This merge request has been going on for eight months. The discussion won't even load. It was so, so long. I mean, this is, whatever he's doing, I don't understand the technical, technical detail. He's doing like a really technically involved stuff. There's a lot of interactions that are going on. Uh, which is great, but for the, those things are pretty rare. I think those are, those are sort of on the extreme. Uh, and the big thing was trying to figure out who these regular contributors were. These are somewhat ranked, uh, like um, people from like George downwards. These are people that have been contributing to GitLab on a, re on a regular basis. Uh, so anyhow, I've kind of rambled on about these three charts. Um, so I looked at these data point and I, I thought to myself, okay, now what? What am I supposed to do with these data or what are some of the things that I need to work on? And I mean, one of the first things I started doing was to talk to some of the people that are sort of on that table. Um, and so it was, you know, I, I was at a point where I need to go beyond looking at these numbers and trying to, uh, trying to figure out what are some of the things that I need to address to uh, invigorate, you know, invigorate the community even, even more so than it was uh, about a year ago. Uh, and the conversations were pretty revealing. I, I talked to them about, well, what was your first motivations for contributing to GitLab in the first place? Because unlike when I was at the Linux Foundation, a lot of the projects, whether it's CNCF, uh, Open Daylight, and others, like, even if you work for like companies like Intel or Ericsson or Huawei, you're sort of on the payroll to contribute to those projects. Uh, so you, I mean, so technically you're given you're, you need to spend X percentage of your time contributing to like OpenStack or other other projects that you're participating in. For GitLab, this is completely voluntary. Like very with very few exceptions, like these people are doing it uh, almost as a hobby uh, in their spare time. Um, so one of my first questions was like, why, why, did you, why did you start contributing and why do you keep coming back? I'm glad that you're doing it, but what's sort of motivating you to do that? And that's, those things are not apparent like when you look at the data point. You, you can tell like who's been contributing a lot, but the why is like more, the, like those things you need to have like one-on-one -on -one conversations almost. Uh, and you know, some of the reasons why people started contributing, it was interesting was, uh, they're a big fan of Ruby, uh, the Ruby language, and then they just did a Google search of open source project based on Ruby. And the GitLab was one of the first things that popped up. They started contributing, uh, got to know some of the GitLab engineers, and it just went on from there. They just, they were like a treated almost like their fellow employees, and they liked the sense of belonging, so they kind of kept, they, they kept contributing uh, for a lot of the people. Uh, and some of the other feedback I got was like, you, you know, think back to your early days, what are some of the things that you struggle with? Uh, and this is not like, uh, I don't think I found anything that was not like, uh, that was atypical. There were things like, I didn't know who to get a hold of if I needed to escalate something or if I had a question. Like those things weren't very well documented in even our con contributing.md file. Uh, and or even finding issues that they can work on. Like, I don't know, like I love to contribute, I love Ruby, but how do I find issues that I can work on that, that you would you know my contribution will be accepted? Uh, so those are the things that I, re like, I mean, I started creating a list of things. Okay, these are the things that I need to improve, for example, on our onboard pages. Or, you know, start, start doing like a YouTube recordings hub. You know, if you're interested in contributing, like here, here's where you start and here's you, how you find issues. Um, the other thing that uh, came uh, that I learned af after discussions with several reg regular contributors, um, so we have uh, what we call the core team. 
so if you've been making sustainable, uh, sustained contrib contribution for or extended period of time, you get in invited to what we call the core team. Uh, some of the other communities have this, like Ruby. Uh, I think we basically replicated what Ruby community does. Uh, so this is kind of an honorary thing. You get invited. I mean, you, get, you have to get voted on by existing core team members. Uh, but some of the perks you get is that you got in, invited to our employee summit. I mean, we, we now call it GitLab Contribute. So once a year we get together, uh, we're a completely remote company, so it's, it's a big deal, like all of us getting together at, uh, uh, at our location. I mean, this past May, we all got together. We all converged in New Orleans. Uh, the year before that, we are in South Africa. So you get invited to that event once a year. Uh, all expenses paid. Uh, and then you also get access to our Slack channels. Uh, so you get to have water cooler conversations with uh, regular GitLab employees and you just have to sign an NDA because uh, you have access to some confidential information. Um, so what I found out from the core team members is that outside of that once a year summit, they don't like necessarily talk to each other. So there wasn't like, a real sense of community. Uh, so they get recognized for their contribution and for their, for their code that they're providing to GitLab, but they weren't necessarily working together. Uh, so I got the sense that they were kind of missing that. Uh, so what I started doing was, was a relatively simple thing. I started a monthly call. So I mean, our core team isn't huge. There are about eight of us. So we have a once a month call and talk about community related topics in general. Uh, so it's all recorded, it's available on YouTube if you want to watch that, but I wanted to bring those like a people closer together uh, and to help improve the community and then also give them another avenue to provide feedback on what's going on in the community, whether it's good or bad. Um, so, um, so, I mean, this, those, those conversations were very helpful and then it helped me go beyond like what the numbers were telling me. Uh, the next one, uh, sorry, this is a bit of an eye chart, and Don, you, you've seen this before. Uh, uh, one of the things, so there are several initiatives that I wanted to ta uh, take when I started. I mean, one was to, I mean, one of the things I did was to recognize like first time contributors. And after a while, I realized that I also need to recognize like people that are making regular contributions, not just, not, not just casual contributions, but making, uh, regular contributions over a year period. So what I did was I, I you know, plagiarized this, plagiarized this rank, uh, from tiers or categories from opensource.com, but broke the group of people into three categories, like a superstar, star, and an enthusiast. And I set the enthusiast bar relatively low, like five merge requests merge per year, roughly like two merge requests, uh, uh, one merge request every other month. I didn't want to set the bar too high. Uh, so I came up with a list of 35 people for 2018. I said, okay, great. So I put this in a Google, Google spreadsheet and I was going down to the list and this is when I reached out to Don and other people in open source community. I was going through the list, I recognized most of the people and then I realized as I was going down the list, it's, there are no, there's no female. I mean, it's like, I felt like I got kicked in the gut. Like I realized this was all like male making regular contributions and uh, I mean I created this to look at regular contributors but it you know made it obvious that we have a DNI issue in, in, in the GitLab community and there are uh, I mean one of the first things I asked Don and a couple of other people to do is can you look at our onboarding or contribute main page and see if there's something that we need to improve and then I also looked at a couple of other things that, that it, that we need to tweak. Uh, so we redesigned the main con uh, you know, contribution page uh, and started a couple of other initiatives. But this is like one of the things that, uh, especially like the last like a quarter or so that I've been working with our community team on improving uh, to help improve diversity in general at, at Git, in the GitLab community. Because this doesn't reflect, like if you look at our engineering staff, uh, ob obviously we can have more uh, engineers and developers from from underrepresented communities, but it's not this horrendous. So obviously that whether it's on purpose or not, we're not sending a good message out to the community and welcoming everybody to contribute. So we're trying to fix that. Uh, but I mean, I use this as an example of, I mean, I created this you know, set of 
like chart or ranking or metrics for one reason, it reveals something else in our community that we need to, we need to work on. So uh, this was an eye opener. Uh, I mean, I was like really stressed when I first saw this list. This was more stressful than like dealing with that code of conduct issue that happened a few months prior, but anyhow. So, uh, so I, I also want to spend a bit of a time on, uh, you know, so I, I told you about some of the metrics I looked at in the early days. What am I looking at uh, in the last few months uh, besides diversity and inclusion? Uh, sorry, the charts are, some of the charts are small, like one in the top left. Uh, so we're look, I'm looking at year over year contributor count. Uh, so we created a com community contribution label in 2015. Uh, so we have the data from 2016 onwards. Uh, last year we had close to about 500 different people making contributions to GitLab. Um, we had, I mean, o across like 28 different projects that we have at GitLab. Uh, and uh, so basically from 2015 to last year, we had about like a 30% year over year growth, which is something that we definitely want to see. Uh, I mean, if you look at our con contribution data per milestone, uh, since it's monthly, there's a lot of like uh, fluctuations. So I like looking at this more of a macro level and year over year, how are we doing? And uh, I've actually seen like this data being presented. I, I wasn't like, necessarily pushing for this. This data being presented to our customers or even to some of our investors, like to show like this uh, continued growth of our community. And this is obviously something that we want to maintain. I mean, not just from a financial perspective. Uh, for me personally, I, I love code coming in. But what's more interesting is a different perspective that people bring in from different different with people with different backgrounds. I did a recording, I think it was last week or the week before, because somebody found a bug, and he's a linguist in like a University of Maryland, he's like a PhD student, he just started contributing to GitLab, because uh, I think like he started as a computer science major as an undergrad, but he just fell in love with linguistics, but he, on his, in his spare time, he continued to dabble in programming. And he found a bug that, that's been sort of sitting there uh, for our website. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't that catastrophic, but he helped debug the issue. Like when I first saw it, I said, oh, it's probably, we probably have a broken master somewhere and then that just needs to be fixed. But he found a different issue that he helped surface and I didn't know how to fix the problem, obviously, but I forwarded it on to a fellow, which he, he passed like that evening, which, which I thought was cool. Like something that our, like one of our community member helped debug, like which I wasn't, uh, uh, otherwise we, we would have found out like a two weeks later and then like people would have probably gone through a lot of frustration because people are having issues contributing like website changes. Uh, it's not a huge thing, but I thought it was pretty cool that people from different backgrounds are contributing. I mean, you can't assign a dollar value to that, but having another set of, uh, another set of eyes like looking at our like product, even if it's, if, even if it's a website, it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, the other thing that I started looking at recently on, on the pie chart, pie chart below, uh, I mean, it's, you see a number of different organizations here like Siemens and CERN. Uh, one, of, one of the cool things that I started seeing is that a lot of our customers, like a CERN and Siemens, have a pretty sizable deployment of GitLab internally. And they found that it's much easier to submit like a merge request to fix a, add a new feature or fix a bug versus like filing an issue and waiting for somebody to pick it up. So uh, definitely want to recognize those work and recognize those people. So I'm starting to look at different uh, organizations. I mean, not all of these are customers like making contributions to GitLab. Um, the other thing, uh, Alberto is in here. This is something that he, uh, Alberto from Detergia helped, helped us look at. And this was, I, for some reason this wasn't as, as trivial as I thought it was going to be, it was a simple question. Um, so I hidden a lot of uh, several different columns there, but uh, the the yellow area shows like merge requests that have been merged over time uh, that came from the community. Obviously, that's that number's been going up, which is great. Uh, and then the area in in green, like in the greenish color, shows our backlogs. How many merge requests are still open? Uh, over a period of time. Because uh, one, one of my concerns was that if, 
if the backlog is just continuing to grow and not enough are getting closed or being being reviewed and merged at, at, at an appropriate rate. Uh, so the good news is that our backlog hasn't been growing, but the bad news is that it's not necessarily going down either. Um, so we've been hiring a lot of people, uh, especially in the engineering ranks. Uh, so the, obviously there's an onboarding period for all new employees, so it's, they're not gonna be productive from day one, but I definitely wanna see that backlog go down a lot more aggressively than, yeah, go ahead, so. Uh, no, those are just raw numbers, so. Oh, so, so. Like as a percentage. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Let me see. Yeah, yeah, it's cumulative. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, so I was trying to set this like a dashboard up myself in 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 Biturgia. I couldn't figure it out, so I had to. Sorry. Uh, get Elbertor's help on it. I still have like that's why I was looking for him this morning. I still have like a few follow up questions. So this is still continuing to be t get get tweaked. Uh, one of the challenges of this data is that it's hard to like look at the data from like six months ago and then validate that the, the data is correct. Because I mean, I can get a, I can, so number of merge requests that are merged, those are easy enough to like understand. Like back in March, how many merge requests do we have open at that point? Uh, so that, it's like, that makes it like a little challenge to test, to make sure that visualization is working correctly. Uh, but we started off with like a smaller project called Pages that have, I mean, that have less than like 10 merge requests coming in per week. I mean, this is for our community edition. And we have, I mean, so the, for, uh, as an example, I think like the last couple of months, the, the number of open MRs each week has been hovering around like a 300. So, yeah. But, did that make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. So, yeah, so, I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, you don't, like Danny said, like, I mean, she did a good job of explaining this uh, in the previous session. I mean, you're not gonna look at the same data over and over again, over like a period of time, your needs change and, uh, and all that. So uh, even if you sort of have, I mean, so one of the interesting thing, like having gone through this like two or three different communities, you figure, you, you think you figured out like what your community dashboard is, and then three months go by and then you have different needs. Like and you have different pain points that you're trying to address. So, um, uh, so yeah, so this uh, backlog chart is something that I probably wanna like contribute to the chaos project itself, like rather than just working with Baturgia, because I think there's a value in like looking at this data for a lot of different communities. So. Cool, uh, last slide. Um, so, one of the things I, I'm beginning to realize, having looked at metrics for uh, several years, is having a good set of metrics and looking at different data points is, is definitely necessary as a good community manager, but it's not sufficient. Like if you don't understand the context, if you don't like dig behind like what's behind the data and what are some of the things that you need to address. Uh, so the context is, is really important. Um, and actually the example I was going to use, uh, Danny also already explained it, net promoter score. It's like, it's like, like a hotel property owner saying my MPS score is 54. Like, well, what does that mean? Is that good or is that bad? Like, I mean, it depends on the context. Like if your MPS score last year was 34 and if you move it to 54, that's great. But if your cohorts are all like in the 70 range, if you're only scoring 54, that, uh, so, you know, when you present the data, especially to your uh, community members and especially, or, and also to your management, like you need to provide set proper context of what's, you know, what's behind the data. If you just, you know, you, if, you know, especially on slides, if you just have a bunch of data and numbers like showing up on the slides, 
uh, that uh, can invite a lot of misinterpretation, and you're not you're going to have more questions than you than uh, than you're providing answers to to your audience. So that's one of the things I, I try to keep in mind, and then. Uh, you know, I didn't talk a whole lot about fluctuations. Uh, I mean, I guess in indirectly I did. Like, since we have a monthly release cycle, uh, you like to see like a data like always going up that way, but that obviously doesn't work, right? For for obvious reasons. So expect fluctuations and don't get too jittery if the numbers like go down like one month, for example. Uh, as long as you understand the reason why, you understand the context. Uh, and that picture there with the little kid, my obligatory cute uh, kid picture, uh, a lot of times what happens is, is like when I see a number, like I don't know what this is telling me. So like sometimes I really struggle with that and, and I'm, I'm sure some of the other community managers too. Uh, another example of this I have is that when I was, when we started uh, the OPNFE project at the Linux Foundation, our first release, our first release came out within like eight months of the project. And Biturja back, uh, back then, like they provided us with a quarterly report. And one of the data point they provided was, here are the, here's the number of people that are doing 85% 80, of the work. I think that's, I think that's right. Like Georg, I don't know if you, uh, I think I called it like core contributors. Like core contributors are the ones that provided 85% of the commits. Uh, and I think that number for that first release was about 20. Uh, I mean, it was a small, still a small community just getting started eight months old. And uh, I mean, at that point, we didn't even need a dashboard. I could have like named like most of the 20 people. Uh, but uh, two releases later, when we got to the third release, I think that number went up to like 85 to 90. Uh, so that was a great number. We more than quadrupled in, in about a year period in terms of the number of core contributors. Uh, so that's great, but then I asked myself, well, is that 85 or 90, whatever that number was, is that good or bad? Like, how many more people do we need? Because all projects need more people, more resources, or at least you would like to. So I had a, you know, when I got the quarterly report, uh, I mean, I, I would usually have a call with our executive director to go over the community health status. And so Heather, the number is this, like, I don't know if that's good or bad. So she and I started having a discussion about, okay, let's, let's assume that we have these 87 people, like, how many people would we want? And we, look, we talked about different projects with, that's having uh, resource constraints. There are a couple of, like, a testing projects that, that were always short of developers, and uh, so we started doing the math. Uh, and I think the conclusion we reached was that you know we don't necessarily need to double the number of people, but if we had another 15 or 20, then I think we would be in decent shape. So they give us a little more context in terms of what the data is telling me. Like we knew that wasn't enough, but by how much, like we didn't necessarily know, just just staring at the numbers. Uh, so a lot of times when I when I see numbers or is data in the dashboard, I just like end up doing this. I said I don't know what this is telling me, and I need to either talk to other people or think more about um, you know, how to make sense of the data. Um, and the last point, I was actually looking for a, tr a graphic or, or a picture on we need, as a community manager, we need to focus on people, not numbers. And that quote came up. And I don't know if a lot of you know Simon Sinek. Like, apparently he's like a th one of the top most watched person on YouTube. He, he's done a lot of TED Talk. And one of the uh, talks he gave was that you don't become a leader until you focus on people, not numbers. And I thought that was a great quote. Uh, like I said, uh, obviously metrics are important, data is important, and it's necessary for all our jobs. But you know, ultimately, our job is to help the community. You know, whatever that takes. And if you take care of the community, numbers will probably take care of itself. So. Anyhow, like, I don't know if I, oh, I did go over time. Sorry about that. So, uh, I guess we don't have time for questions, but I'm happy to stick around and we'll figure out where to go for beers. So, all right, thanks. sounds good. So, uh, so thank you, Ray. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And again, thanks to our sponsors.